The lake is entirely frozen it's right now, frozen solid. and it will probably still be frozen, which means there won't, there won't be any water fowl, no water birds. Eagles. Just the eagles. Could eagles. Pretty, pretty smart. Yeah. There were three eagles yesterday. Yeah. Eagles like to sit out there. It's as soon as it starts melting, though, it can be really good out there. Yeah, exactly. Because then they eat all the dead fish in the ice. All right. Other things to think about as the, the cold continues on. I'm thinking about my garden for the spring. So hopefully the talk tonight helps you consider some of the things you might be growing this coming year. So tonight we have Denise Craig. Denise worked as a high school teacher of psychology and sociology, then as assistant principal. She started as a backyard bird watcher and became an Audubon Society member. After being a Sedgwick County Master Gardener volunteer, her interest in feeding birds with native plants led to an obsession with growing natives. This in turn brought a realization that those native plants also attract all kinds of insects, most that she had never even seen before. So hopefully we'll hear a lot about all these things tonight. Welcome, Denise. Thank you. I have tried, oh, I wanna make sure you can hear me. I have tried to, Put it, my sister said too many words. I said, that, that'll be up there a long time. They can read it. But the, uh, I'm going to try to get you to understand that you must garden um, for our world. Or actually, for the United States of America, for the wildlife of America. That's the goal. And I've been heavily influenced by the works of Doug Tallamy and uh, entomologists of all kinds. As a matter of fact, I'm kind of a wannabe entomologist now, but it's way too late for me. Anyway, um, I am a master gardener uh, that is sponsored by Sedgwick County Extension, which is supported by Kansas State University. And it's an excellent organization in the same way that Audubon is an excellent organization. It's full of decent people <laughs> who want to do good things generally who owned the first Priuses I ever saw <laughs> way ahead of the curve in Wichita Kansas and so um, I am dressed like a woman who's been cold for four days and I would not take off my layered tights and sweats and tops but in honor of the Master Gardener program I did put on our uniform shirt and I think it did not enhance my appearance. <laughs> but I wanted to give them credit. It was an excellent group for me to belong to. And uh, what's important is that my path to insects was a crooked one. They just let me, all I had to do was volunteer hours and educational hours. And they didn't assign what I had to learn. So you would just go in any direction. Yeah? It's hard to hear. Okay, go ahead. You just keep talking. I can barely hear you. Okay, is this better? No. I need it over here. Right. No, just go ahead and I'll turn this up, but go ahead and okay. speak a little bit louder. Maybe we could raise your mic. Uh, yeah. Maybe it could be fastened on her inner shirt instead of the. <coughs> yeah, here we go. <laughs> Thank you. Try that. Okay, is that better? Is that better? We'll find out. All right, I can also speak louder. Um, I, I can. The I mentioned Doug Tallamy because I, his book, his first book, um, was the one that actually altered my life. I actually said, this is why you became a master gardener. This is why you've always loved the outdoors. I just didn't know it until I was 75 years old. Well, I was a little younger, 70. <laughs> Have to find that arrow, there it is. And what I'm gonna talk about in this speech is what gardeners need to know, how, what you need to believe, how you need to change some of their gardening practices. I almost feel like I'm talking to the choir because you guys already are gardening and understand a lot more about wildlife than most people. Um, 
Talamy's book, not his most recent one, but one of, the, one of the ones I enjoyed a lot was Nature's Best Hope. And in it, he says that we have a global problem, the insect decline and the bird decline. He said, but he believes strongly that we have a local solution and that's backyard gardeners. And he says, you are nature's best hope. And remember, he's an entomologist and those guys are serious. They are right out of E.O. Wilson's group. We're in the middle of what they say is the sixth extinction and we can stop it. Backyard gardeners can stop it because we individually own the only undeveloped land left in the United States, in the 48. We own the land that adds up to lots of acreage and if all of our communities do just this little bit, individuals doing a little bit, we will be able to create connections to the national parks, to the state parks. Um, there's an interesting image going around, I, I couldn't find it, uh, but you've all seen Persian rugs and they're beautiful complexity. He said, so here is a Persian rug. It's gorgeous, it is a Persian rug. And then they, the next picture shows it cut into pieces and it's all separated. He said, this is not a Persian rug. And that's the metaphor for what has happened to nature in uh, North America. Nature has been carved into pieces and those pieces must somehow be connected and we can do it. So you have to be advocates. I just want you to be so many things. Um, you need to make a decision to grow insects. That, it, that actually becomes your primary goal. I do garden, I love beauty, I want flowers. I want beautiful flowers of all kind. But I'm gonna focus in terms of my structure of the garden and choice of plants. I'm gonna focus on supporting insects. Uh, flowers are the absolutely necessary source of food for adult insects, the nectar and the pollen. But plant choices matter more than we knew before. Um, your best plans to put in your garden is as many natives as you can get into the garden. And when I say native, I mean very natives from this eco region, the central plains, the great plains. And now the science isn't good enough to say couldn't be northern plants, southern plants. They haven't gotten that far. This is this research is only two or two or three years old. They just haven't refined it yet. But for example, Saladago is one perennial that they know supports specialist bees. I don't know which plant a specialist bee has to have that pollen from that small species or genus of plants. Uh, pollens evolved separately, the bee evolved with it, and then they the pollen is necessary for reproduction. So if you're going one solid doggo, but it's not the one that this bee needs, that bee can become extinct. They are the most at risk of becoming extinct. Now what I do, since I don't know which solid doggo attracts which bee, and by the way, most entomologists don't either, um, I plant as many species of solid doggo as I can. And that's kind of fun. You just say, oh, that's a new species, I'll plant that. And there are flaws in my plan, but we'll get to those. Um, this is the most recent, uh, this reference on this page. Doug Tallamy, uh, he's asked to speak all the time. And the most recent one was this one for the harryinstitute.org. And it's nature's best hope, conservation that starts in your yard. He's absolutely fluent in entomology knowledge. What I like is I work hard and I read these books and I pull this article in and I do this. I'm trying so hard to organize this mass of data. His whole career is devoted to seeing the patterns. And he'll, in every speech he gives, he'll show me a new way to think, a new way to think about uh, the patterns. And that's why that this speech actually includes one of the new ways of thinking. Uh, the, many of the pictures are me, my garden, my flowers, my insects. But I still have far to go to be a really good gardener. Now one thing that I believe you have to change is that you have to believe that nature is not infinite. And also 
that nature is what keeps us alive. Humans can live because nature does its job. And the job um, of plants, for example, that's what I focused on here, are ecosystem services uh, for uh, us. They produce oxygen, we knew that. They capture carbon, we knew that. Um, they clean our water. We've learned more and more that uh, plants with good root systems and are placed in certain places in the drainage systems, they'll keep that water clean before it gets into the rivers. Uh, of course, they capture topsoil. There's so much data now about the amount of a heavy rainstorm. The trees in your yard are stopping the flooding because those leaves are holding the water. It can't all get to the ground at once. So the more trees you put in the yard, uh, there are many reasons why that's good, but trees are vital. Um, Doug Tallamy thinks we could easily, most yards could have five oak trees, and he is not kidding. <laughs> so, oh yeah, and this other thing, they do convert sunlight into food for the animals. And by the way, this is, um, brown ambrosia aphids. I've never seen them before, but they were on this Maximilian sunflower in droves. And you could say, how is that keeping me alive or nature alive? How can those horrid aphids be doing that? Well, aphids are the base of the animal food network. They suck plants and then they are eaten by other animals. Now, a bird has to eat about 200 aphids to make the equivalent of one caterpillar. So our birds pretty much prefer caterpillars. Um, and the caterpillars produce some chemicals that are important for their babies. But anyway, aphids, if you don't have aphids somewhere in the back of your garden on a plant that you're sacrificing to aphids, uh, you won't have ladybugs. You won't have those insect predators. Um, and we want those. Now, backyard gardeners, we can act as conservationists or preservationists, but mostly we are restorationists. There isn't anything left of nature that we can go in and find and preserve. Now, in Kansas, actually, there is a park up, uh, uh, up in the Kansas City area. There is a park that has never been developed and they're using that as a preserve. And they did a study in just the last few years of specialist bees. And the specialist bees are the ones that have to have the particular pollen they evolved with. And their young cannot eat other pollen. And so that they want to see what's going on in Kansas. You know, reading their findings are stunning, but one of the most stunning things was that one of the specialist bees puts its nest inside of uh, snail shells. It has to have that snail to reproduce. I'm thinking, what? what is nature doing? Well, what nature does is it creates billions of interactions between plant and plant, plant and insect, insect and insect. And that's what's out there. In real nature, it's nothing but stuff going on that humans don't see, don't care about, ignore, whatever. Well, we can't do that. We actually have to help nature create some more of those interactions. Uh, there's a guy, uh, Aldo Leopold wrote a book, and in that book he talks about the land ethic, which I kind of hold on to. He says, wouldn't it be great if we could live on a piece of land and not spoil it? And this gets back to you guys as gardeners. 78% of the United States uh, is privately owned. That they're talking now. There are other groups like I suppose KGE or places like that own some land, but most of that is in the hands of private people like us. Just one person who or a family that owns a one yard, and. Uh, that's a lot of land and there is no other piece, there is no other place in this continent where you can find that much land on which to focus on saving insects and as Tallamy says, North American wildlife. He doesn't pull punches. 
E.O. Wilson done, didn't pull punches. He said, we're in the middle of the sixth extinction and humans won't make it through. But Doug Tallamy says, wait, wait, wait. We have a way so that there isn't a sixth extinction. If we can mobilize this grassroots movement of back, people who own pieces of the biosphere, your yard, and who plant the correct plants in that place. Um, you can, I've already talked about the teeny tiny relationships. And then what we want is so that everybody isn't just, we don't have to go to Estes Park or to the Grand Canyon to visit nature. We actually would have nature in our yard. Our children would be walking through the leaves of nature if you recreate all of those pieces. Now, I want to show you this. I did not take this picture. My son did. But I had to point it out to him. Common milkweed, one of my favorite plants. Everyone's afraid of it because it is a thug. But in the spring, it grows huge, huge. It's five, six feet tall, and it is covered with these big blossoms. And your, that part of your yard will smell of a perfume. And if you just plan ahead so that you can control it, like if it gets in my lawn, I don't worry. We mow it. That's done. Um, but the interactions here, you have a honeybee who was foraging for nectar. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's a crab spider there who was waiting to have a dinner. And then you have the, you have the pollen and the nectar all over that. So this is a play. If you put common milkweed in your garden, you will have lots more animal, animal, plant, animal interactions. And some of them will be shocking to you. I actually, the first year my natives got mature, was quite surprised at how much slaughter I saw. I'd say, well, here's another thing. He's killing that insect. It was, that's what they do. It's a jungle in your garden. And they are, they are eat or be eaten, just like on the plains of Africa, those animals are surviving in your garden and they don't need us. They don't care about us. They're just doing their nature job. Now, so what I've already hinted what purpose I want you to choose, but what, you, what is more important than the beauty in your garden, if you believe that you can play a role in saving North American wildlife, if you believe that and otherwise believe that North American wildlife will not make it. And you can read the books, they'll explain it to you. It, it takes a long time for things to go extinct, but it's coming. And in some parts of the world, it's here. Um, so creating a functional ecosystem is your first goal. Beauty is still there and you wanna pick beautiful plants. I know all of that because I love, I love iris. It's unforgivable, but I do. Um, we will talk about plant choice, because that's the most important decision you will make as a gardener. Which plants do I put in my garden or my landscape? And then that will, of course, be, I want you to focus on uh, natives. And when I say natives, I mean native to our Great Plains ecosystem, ecoregion. And there are charts online that, that tell me is, and then, um, Wildlife Organization, whose name just slipped right out of my head. Um, they have the whole charts on it, and they'll say, these are the specialist bees that evolved here, and here are the plants that will help this specialist bee. And they can't do that often, because again, they don't know all, they can't match all the plants to the specialist bees. And the other thing I'm gonna say is, if you grow your garden for specialist bees, these bees that are on the brink of extinction, they depend on this single small group of plants. The rest of the bees will prosper. You, you create, you focus on that bee and all the insects will prosper in your garden because you're doing, you're gonna create a system that supports insects. If you support a specialist bee, you're supporting them all. You know, it would be absolutely um, poison free. You don't create a home for insects and then poison it. That's just counterproductive. Um, you'll focus upon natives, of course. Not all natives are the best. So you'll 
find out about keystone plants. For example, the willow is a keystone plant in our area. Well, for a long time, I was trying to plant pussy willows to get that flower, early flower in the spring. But it turns out I might have gotten an early flower in the spring, but I sure wasn't saving a specialist bee. And so um, I've heard someone, uh, I've heard that the, at the John Pear group down in south of Wichita, they are doing tests on willows now. So I suspect they're trying to find a willow tree that will work well here, that won't look ugly. I have black willows, the kinds that grow up along streams and along old ponds on a farm. And they, you know, they break down, they're ugly, but black willows are natives and they feed a lot of insects. And you know, I have a place big enough. It just breaks off and we haul off the log and another shoot comes up. And then, uh, so I need you to focus upon two kinds of insects. This is actually Doug Tallamy talking through me. He said, we cannot save all the insects. Remember, we're dealing with possibly a four by four area in the corner of our yard. Some of you might have a larger space for a garden, but you're, a small space in your yard is what you want to go for, a, a space that you can maintain. And, um, he says, all right, we're focusing on two groups of insects that are vital to the lives of the rest of the insects. They're the sine qua non for the rest of insect and wildlife. And those are the caterpillars and the uh, specialist bees, or pollinators, really. All the pollinators, including the specialist bees. Um, the caterpillars, and this is a, I'll show you more later, um, we know that 96% of terrestrial birds must have protein and fats to feed their babies in the nest. There's research about chickadees. A uh, medium-sized nest of chickadees will need 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get that nest to fledge. And then the parents still have to be chasing caterpillars for those babies. Um, we now know that a nest of chickadees uh, forages for food in an area like about, I don't know, 50 meters around their nest. So that means if you want a nest of chickadees, you have to have the food in your yard. And the best way to do that is plant trees that support caterpillars. And the best tree of all that supports caterpillars is the oak tree. And you have to find an oak tree that is native to Kansas. And don't worry, people will say, well, you'll never see that grown up, you'll never see that tree as an adult. I plant baby oaks all the time. I say, I'm not planting the oaks for me. I'm planting the oaks for North American wildlife. I have space, I can do it. And then the native bees, of course, uh, they're vital for the reproduction of plants. The reproduction of plants is vital for biodiversity. Um, if you have a biodiverse group of plants, let's say all those solidagos that I'm producing, I have a lot of biodiversity among one genus, and that means that it is creating complexity. And that complexity in my yard, of, I think I have five species, uh, makes um, complexity in the ecosystem. I have bees going back and forth. All of them can use the solid algal nectar. Some of them might be specialist bees who need that plant's nectar. I don't know that. By the way, there's a, a writer, Heather Holm. She writes a lot about bees and the flowers they support, or flowers and the bees they support. So I think I have two or three of her books. They're almost overwhelming. The pictures are wonderful. And, and she has all this information on the page. But what it does help me is to say, for example, the squash. This is a specialist bee that's called the squash bee. And he grows on, uh, he, she needs the pollen off of your yellow squash, your, your zucchini in New York. That's the pollen for this squash bee. She's all over the United States. So if you have a squash, a bee in your squash flowers. Uh, sometimes honeybees will be there, so you can tell them apart. But this will probably be a little black and white bee. They're all a half an inch long and black and white, and who knows what they are. But 
uh, if you have a beetle, in, uh, a bee in your squash, and it's not a honeybee, it's a squash bee. You have a specialist bee, and you are supporting it by planting the squash. So that's what, um, what we do. I'm, I'm never growing squash for the vegetable, but now I'm gonna try to grow squash for the bee because I want to have, I'm trying to create a new relationship on my land in my garden between an insect and a plant that had never been there. That's how you create an eco function, a larger ecosystem. Every time you add a plant and you get an insect, you have added to the complexity of your garden. All right, now let's see. You can't save all the insects and you've got to be smarter than you have ever been. Uh, you focus upon the two most vital groups and those are the pollinators, which I always read as native bees, and then caterpillars. And you must be knowledgeable, so you must do research and, and the material is out there. It's, of course, in bookstores like the one down in this hall, and in bookstores like the one at Botanica, and in libraries, and then the stuff online is everywhere. You also, so you have to know about plants, and you have to know about insects. You have to be able, when you see an insect on one of your plants, you do not squash it or kill it until you know what it is. Now, that means I've tried to learn about insect eggs. I think I now know squash bug eggs. And I know uh, aphid eggs. But, and I know uh, monarch egg. But I'm pretty poor in the area of identifying eggs. I'm not very good at that. But I don't squash them until I try really hard to find out what that egg is going to produce. And I find larvae and pupa and I have to be able to identify those. So you'll just build this library online or wherever so that you can, and by the way, online will get you a bunch of information. I have, when I see new wasps and things, I have literally typed into Google, black insect, one inch long, has an orange abdomen. And up it comes, and it turns out it wasn't a wasp at all. This particular one was the Midas fly. It did not know something like, it looked like a great big giant black wasp, but it was the Midas fly, which is a pollinator. Um, plant choice matters, be intentional at every joint, and pick natives from this equal region and pick keystone plants. And this is a solidago, this is a fireworks. Fireworks, solidago supports many specialist bees, but that's only one species that I have on my place and I'm trying to add more. And it isn't easy. I go out and I find two or three natives, usually at the Dick Arboretum. I'm not given a plug for a commercial place. It's a, a private arboretum where they, they're trying to have native plants and educate people about uh, native things. And um, I'll find maybe another solidago there. And they, their volunteers have created a little solidago this size. So you get that little baby solidago and you get three or four of them, although these guys, the entomologists, be, they, you know, get six or seven, don't even bother with less. I'm sorry, I'll get three or four and feel like a crusader. Um, and then you plant them together and you just have to, they may not live. It's hard for a native plant to live. It has to produce good roots, it can't be eaten. And there are a lot of problems being a native plant. But if you can get it to age three or four, the problems begin to cease and the bounty begins to, to uh, grow. This solidago, with all that density and all that flower, that's probably a five-year-old solidago. Now you have to be knowledgeable uh, about insects. And here's how and why. I want to have that butterfly. Can you see my point? <laughs> that butterfly. It's a Gulf fritillary. And he, uh, that butterfly drinks the nectar of the passion flower. I've grown passion flower before, so I didn't know about the butterfly. But look at this larvae. That's like a monster from, I don't know, from a horror movie. If you see that monstrous larvae, you have to stop yourself and say, wait, 
I'm going to get that butterfly. It, you can't squash as if squashing is the only re, uh, thing you can do. And then, of course, you all know about black swallowtails on fennel or parsley. Um, and the male black swallowtail is brilliant. I mean, it's wonderful. And the, if you notice the striping on the black swallowtail, I'll have people say, oh, I've got a monarch. And I always say, what's the monarch larvae feeding on? What plant is it on? They'll say, oh, it's on my fennel or it's on my dill. I say, not a, black, not, not a monarch. Monarchs will only be found on milkweed. Nowhere else. Or they're going to die. Um, but if you have a, a striped animal like that, and they're big, they get to be big, uh, on any of your parsley family things, uh, you've got a black swallowtail in the making, and those are more prolific than your monarch. I'll have five or six larvae on my, I have a big fennel, it must also be five or six years old. And uh, I get lots of uh, black swallowtail larvae. And then in terms of your attitudes toward these animals, you must be able to identify the larvae, and you also have to be able to tolerate some plant damage. You can't uh, get fussy about a couple nibbles in a leaf or, or even several leaves. Those uh, monarch caterpillars will eat a lot. Of, they will eat your milkweed down to the stem. Milkweed's tough. That caterpillar will move on, and if you have, still have enough season and enough water, they'll come back. And I actually had um, another group of monarchs must have laid eggs in the late summer because I had cat, uh, monarch caterpillars all over the milkweed that had been stripped. Now that surprised me and it makes me worry about it because that monarch should have been heading south for Mexico, not laying eggs. So there are some problems with that particular animal. You must be knowledgeable about plants. This is um, a great one. This is Zizia, also is called Golden Alexander. And it has the tiniest flowers. Each of those little, it's like an umbrella and it holds up on the tip of each of the umbrella is this little tiny cluster. And it may look like a little daisy, but it's not. There are lots of teeny tiny umbrellas there, and they're each holding up one dinky flower. And they feed our small insects. You must plant tiny flowers so that you can feed the small insects. And what will be the small insects? I actually, this year, on Azizia, I'm pretty certain I found one of the teeny tiny wasps that's a parasitoid. They're almost invisible, but it was such a tiny animal, it definitely had a waist, and that made me think that this could be a wasp. And it was feeding on those, it wasn't much bigger than those teeny tiny flowers. I feel very proud, I'm <laughs> positive, that was a parasitoid. And they are the best killers of insects of all. And you could say, why do we want to kill insects? The easiest example is the monarch. She has 100 eggs. If she lays all of those 100 eggs and all of them succeed and become monarchs, there isn't enough milkweed in your garden or the neighborhood or a park to feed this single female's 100. Unless all the other females were sterile or something. They have too many eggs will produce too many caterpillars, and something's got to control that overpopulation of insects, they'll eat the whole world uh, if they aren't stopped. And the predators and the parasitoids, my favorite insects of all, do that. They do that uh, killing. Okay, now what's a keystone species for caterpillar? Uh, and these are the trees. Ptolemy early on um, had his graduate students climb into the tops of trees and count caterpillars and identify the species. This is in his first book, um, which I've forgotten the title to. It, it'll come to me tomorrow. Um, but in his first book, this did stop me cold on this page. I said, what? Because not all natives are equally good for animals. Natives are better than exotics, of course. They're uh, better than most stuff, but they're not better than all natives. And these native trees and shrubs and um, 
herbaceous plants, they support more caterpillars on their leaves than other species. So the oak, he, uh, Tallamy has written a whole book about oaks. I haven't read that yet. I'm just I'm on overload. I have more than I can learn right now. Um, this oak down here, his, his students are in those trees counting. And this is an old, uh, this was his, one of his, this was his first book, I believe. And um, he said the oaks, they found four, 543 different species of moth larvae or uh, butterfly larvae in eating the leaves of oaks. Now, of course, he didn't find 543 on one oak, but they kept counting species that could live on oak leaves. Now, remember, you've got a chickadee that needs 6,000 worms to raise a litter or a nest. Um, and I think, where's she gonna get them? Well, we've got two or three oaks in your yard. She's got a head start on getting them. If you have, look at this, the maple produces, has 247 different species that live on its leaf. And what I really like is the crab apple. I like to do understory trees uh, because they flower and I want those flowering. And I need the flowers for the, the bees and, well, and all the nectar, but I need the leaves for the other animals. And the crab apple I have, will support 308. And what else? Oh, I have cottonwoods. I live in the country and they kind of plant themselves. And my husband, Long, he's always loved cotton, cottonwoods. And I would look out and he'd plant another seedling. You know, they grow up at those trees, shed that cotton. And he planted little cottonwoods everywhere. Well, that was about 50 years ago and they're all dying now. But in the meantime, a cottonwood will support 367 different species of Lepidoptera larvae. And Lepidoptera is the entomologist word for either moth or uh, butterfly. Now down here, we've got a solidago. We know that solidago supports a specialist species. I don't have the number in my head, but it's something like 50. It supports something like 50 specialist bees in Kansas. And look, it also supports, uh, has a lot of worms living on its leaves, which means it's supporting birds and other wildlife too. So that's a valuable plant. The aster, and I grow the New England aster, it's not the easy, it's a great big lanky native. Many people hate, you know, it gets too tall, it falls down, it, you know, it can be so ugly. But I have been able to make myself prune it every 4th of July. I have to have dates like that, that have, oh, it's the 4th of July. And I cut off a third, maybe, I never have done a half, but I cut off a third of all my New England aster. And that's gonna allow them to branch more, and you're gonna get a beautifully uh, flowering plant. And those flowers occur, this is what's ma what matters, in the fall. Same with solidago, the flowers in the fall. And then I've got a sunflower there, my favorite, I think that's the Maximilian sunflower. I love that plant. It's the same thing. Grows up too tall. It's covered by these flowers up and down. The stem gets too heavy, it falls over. So I try to have plants it can fall onto. And then sometimes I get a really pretty vignette, you know, by accident. Anyway, and the sunflower supports 73 caterpillars. So those are the plants that are keystone species for caterpillars. And then we've got um, keystone plants for specialist bees. And it's a host plant. You know how the monarch's host plant is the uh, milkweed? Host plants for the specialist bees are things like the solidago. Some species we don't know. Um, the aster, some species we don't know yet. The science is young. Um, but this you need to know. In Kansas, we have 170 specialist bees. That's 43% of our native bee population. This isn't a joke in Kansas. That's almost half of all our native bees. Uh, the only place that has more um, specialist bees is Texas. Uh, it's bigger. Uh, now you can grow, here's what I did last summer. You can grow many keystones from seed. The sunflowers, you can buy mis multiple packets of different kinds of sunflowers and you can plant those from seed. Uh, you can do the same with coneflowers, rudbeckia, buying different species. I've even grown false indigo. 
uh, from seed. But I do it in this process called uh, winter sowing. And uh, on Super Bowl Sunday, I cut a jug, like a milk jug in half. I put really good soil in there, moistened. I take the seeds that I've harvested from my own plant, I push them down inside that. I put that lid back over, duct tape it, label it, because I'm the kind of person who forgets what's growing in there. Label it, and then I put it out in the snow, and I forget about it until sometime in April or sometimes in March, the sun gets too hot, and I do watch for germination. And um, if the sun gets too hot, it will boil or burn those babies. And so that's when you have to start caring for them. You open the jug on a hot day. You close it when the cold night comes. And so it's a little fussy, but you're growing very difficult to grow native plants. And you're growing bunches of them. You know, you're gro you don't have to go buy a whole bunch of, you know, those tray trays full of flowers. First of all, they won't be natives. They'll be petunias. Petunias will provide nectar, that's cool, but the pollen, and they will provide pollen to many, many, many bees, because many bees are generalists, and also probably to butterflies, but they will not help a specialist bee. Uh, what else here? Um, Gallardia, I had excellent luck this year with Gallardia, um, and I've never grown it before. And then here's an aster, and this is in the fall. It produces its flowers in the fall. And uh, the goldenrod and the sunflowers produce their flowers in the wall, fall. And um, the migrating monarch must have nectar in the fall. Uh, the question mark butterfly, great big orange butterfly, is going to actually go into diapause in the winter. It's going to bury itself under the bark of a tree. And sometimes on a warm February week, you'll look up and see this bright orange butterfly, and he shouldn't be there. It takes a lot of his energy to come to life, and then he'll have to go back to sleep when the cold hits again. If he does that many times, he won't be able to wake up in the spring. So it's alarming to see them out. I don't want them to do that, but it's still kind of a gift. Um, That I have a list of native plants. This will be easy for you to find anywhere. And these were recommended by the Xerxes Society. Can't, can't say it, sorry. But here's what you have to do. The research, these, somebody does research in yards on stuff. And she discovered that nest of chickadees, or a nest of chickadees, could nest, could raise one set of fledgling, one set of babies, to adulthood, could remate, have another nest, a second nest in that same summer to uh, get those things, those babies to fly. If your yard had 70% biomass of native leaves, sounds impossible. I mean, it was, I thought it had to be a typo. Thought, That's not possible. But I was thinking in terms of flowers, perennials, things like that. You mustn't think of that. Those trees, those trees, the ones that have those leaves that support butterflies, those are going to feed our birds. They feed them now. We just didn't know it. We did not know those leaves were full of caterpillars. This is a plant I grew Culver's root. It's a native. It's about this tall and it has these gorgeous candelabra flowers and you better deadhead it. Um, I've got two giant plants and I didn't deadhead it this fall. I could live to regret that. It's just the zizia. If you don't deadhead that zizia, you will regret it. But yeah, what? it's not hard and I'm not a good gardener. You go out and I just take shears, <laughs> deadheading done. Here are more recommendations. I want you to notice the red bud. A red bud is covered with thousands of flowers. That's a lot of nectar. And it's a, a pretty soon it will have leaves. That's a lot of leaves to be support. And by the way, it does support a lot of caterpillars. This is a monarda. And I've had a little trouble. That's the uh, native monarda fistulosa. And I, um, I dug my first one. It was the best. And I dug and divided it. And it has had trouble coming back. I'm through dividing my plants until they're like I don't know, 10 years old. 
Now, how are you going to find space to grow all these natives? And remember, you already have a garden, probably. I'm not, nobody's asking you, uh, here's a case in point. You have a mature ginkgo tree in your yard. At no time anywhere has any of those graduate students found more than five caterpillars surviving on the leaves of a ginkgo. Now, it's a great tree, it grows, it's beautiful, great, and I bet if you went to China, it would be covered with insects that can live on those leaves, but not here. So when you reduce lawn, I make tree islands. This person did something else that kind of created a giant decorative hedge perennial border thing. That's actually a lot of work. Uh, but what they're doing is reducing the lawn and they're adding flowering native plants. Now the other thing, if you have a lawn and maybe you're able to get away with it, you can create a bee lawn. There are places, uh, universities in Minnesota and in the north are trying to develop seeds that will create bee lawns, which means they'll be tough and can handle the mowing and the walking. There'll be low flowers so that even when you mow, it won't mow those flowers and that gives them uh, food for the bees. And one of the things that they use, and these are not natives, but they are nectar sources, uh, is a Dutch white clover. Now I did buy some Dutch white clover seeds, but I've been very, very, I'm afraid to try new things. You know, to just throw those out there and I, I should, nothing else is growing after last year's drought. So anyway, that's called creating a bee lawn. And remember, uh, the lawn is a monoculture. It feeds nothing. It soaks up homeowner money, gasoline, fertilizer, pesticides. It causes pollution because homeowners don't pay attention to the application instruction. They believe that homeowners pollute more with pesticides and fertilizer than farmers do because they're not paying attention to the instructions. So always read those instructions. And, uh, but here I want you to see the United States has 30 to 40 million acres of lawn. That's a lot of undeveloped land for the insects. Okay, now how are you going to garden for bees? Bees are pretty, imp they do need flower, flower nectar and flower pollen. And we already know they need a variety of, you need to try to find the plants that have specialist pollen for specialist bees, which is not an easy task. Nobody knows to say to you, go out and buy a firework solidago and you will have these two specialists. They don't know that. So you just do your best. But uh, if you provide habitat, homes, places where these animals can live, that means it's got to be pesticide free, a place where they can live, shelter, get out of the rain, uh, find a place to nest, and also have sources of food and water for them. Um, I wanna show you right in this, in that one over there. Uh, that's on a deck garden I have, and I kind of let things grow where they will, but it's not actually enough flowers. I have some uh, black-eyed Susans, I have some um, sunflowers, I have some obedient plants, I have a variety of flowers, but that isn't the best way to provide flowers to bees. This is the new thing I'm trying to learn. Now, out there in my lawn, um, those, that's some kind of primrose. It's a pink primrose. I don't know which one it is. I thought it was, you know, I'll have to look it up. But it was naturalizing. And that was great because that was a lot of flowers. And remember, you have a lot of flowers. Those insects come down. They come down to find food. And if you have habitat for them, they may stay and build a house and have babies. And that's what we want. That's how we save the insects. Now, here's the solid news about flowers. I said it's not enough to grow flowers. You have to grow more flowers than you thought, more species than you thought. Um, 12 to 20 different species of flower. Now, I'm, I've got five species of goldenrod, but I do not have a four-foot square swath of each species. 
That means I need to go buy, I don't know, a dozen more specimens of each of my goldenrod plants. So you'll notice that you have to make some hard decisions. Is this plot in my garden supporting much? Then maybe this is where I will grow sunflowers. And I can get many kinds of sunflowers to grow all, and I can make a pretty thing out of it. And I'll have multiple species, and I can plant them so they cover eight foot swaths. And then the next, best, the next species takes another eight foot swath. We don't even have gardens that big. So what we're doing is we modify with what we've got. Uh, there's a, a woman, uh, she was a master gardener here in, at Sedgwick County years ago, and she's written a book. And she had, the, she had a formula. She said, if you're starting out, you don't have a garden, you've never had a garden, or you don't know where to start, she said, this is the minimum. Okay, you've got spring, summer, fall. It has to be all season, all growing season long. So in the spring, three species. Just pick three flowers that you love with all your heart. They're in the 80s, I would hope. And then a minimum of three specimens of each of those. So in that one corner, you're gonna have, let's see, three times three times three. You have nine flowers, maybe. Did I do that right? Maybe, maybe it's 27. <laughs> but then in the summer, you do the same thing. Three different species, at least three specimens of each species. Okay, that's three times, that's nine. And then again in the fall, you do the same thing. And that is a, you can have that in a corner of your yard and you can have lots of flowers and it's not the way you want your garden to end up but it's the way you can start it, and it's a good start, and it's affordable. Which gets me to this point. You can use annuals. You might have to use annuals to get all the flowers you need in your garden. The perennials take a long time, and they'll never produce flowers all the time. So you're gonna use annuals, and you can use, uh, these are my, some of my favorites. That's a zinnia is the orange flower. And that is a favorite, my own, the only marigold I love. That's a harlequin marigold, and it's an heirloom. And I have to get online to find those seeds. But it kind of makes a loose, a loosely branched shrub. It's not like that little dense marigold plant that just looks, I don't know, squat to me. Um, these flowers can provide nectar to almost anything, uh, to adult insects. They can provide... Um, pollen to most of the animals, but they will not support specialist bees. The nectar will, but not the, not the pollen. But nonetheless, you can buy a flat of, I don't know, you can buy seeds of zinnias and plant in two weeks, stagger that planting, and you'll have flowers all through the season. And that's a packet of seeds, which is, I don't know, two ninety nine dollars something like that. Now, but the other thing about bees, if you want to grow bees in your yard, um, they have to have nests, and we have to help them with nests. And you use your whole yard where you can. Um, the mason bee is one I've read about because it's a, it has an amazing life. They are an early spring bee. They're called, some of the ones, the ones I was reading about, are orchard bees. And they're used in the Northwest uh, to pollinate apple orchards, things like that. Uh, also, you know, orchards in the Northwest. But um, this mason bee will hatch in the early spring. And she's been in one of those wooden tunnels that you see in all the garden forest shops. They'll have a cute little box with little hollow tunnel bamboo things. She's the one who will live in that, who will nest in that. But you have to read your books about that because if you let it get bacteria filled or anything, you have to keep it clean. Um, so she will. The mason bee uses mud and you always have to have the sealed off back end. So she will go, go into a tube or dig a tube into a log um, or, well, let's see, I don't have the camera. Uh, I found a little black and white bee tunneling into an iris. I love iris, and they're virtually useless to these animals. But when I saw that native bee tunneling into it, they must have nest sites. 
and the tube of an iris, the, two, the big long thick, even of a daylily might be big enough. Uh, sunflowers, pithy, pithy stems. And so we will provide lots of homes for them in that way. Anyway, 90% of these uh, native bees are solitary and 70% nest in the ground. Uh, that means you must have bare ground. No mulch, no grass, nothing, just bare ground. Now that sounds hard. Unless you have, a, I don't know, a place behind your garage that you can't get anything to grow. It's too hot, the slope is too long, the sun burns the ground, you can't get anything to grow there. See if you can't grow bees. These bees will um, tuddle into the ground and they do their, their uh, loners, their solitaries. So you might see 25 little holes that you, you can see little bees going in and out of, but they are not helping each other. Each of them, are, that's 25 little females, created that tunnel into the ground. At the end of the tunnel, she creates a cell. And into that cell, she lays one egg. And then she goes, the mason bee will probably have to visit they say 50,000 flowers to finish one of these lengths that she's trying to save her species. And her whole production will involve eight to 12 eggs. That's all she does. And it takes all 21 days of her life, her trips to get mud to seal them, her trips to get flat nectar, her trips to get pollen, and then to repeat that after she seals the nest. These guys are earning a living. If you see an adult bee out flying around, just think he's on his deathbed right there. The, if it's a male, it's gonna die probably pretty soon. But if it's a female, she's working hard to grow her species. And so we wanna help them as much as we can. Now in this a picture showing one side of my yard, I always save dead logs, just throw them out there. They decay, I don't know who uses them, but bees mind. And that bunch grass, it has a beautiful feathery seed top, but it is also a bear. Uh, it just grows around and I had to dig it out again this year to try to control all of that grass. But what the bumblebees will do is those bunch grasses. If you have bunch grasses, a bumblebee might nest inside there. Maybe a mouse has built a nest in there and the bumblebee will find that. She overwinters there. And so bunch grasses are a good thing to do. Back on behind your carport or garage where you've got that dry, grow some bunch grasses. They wouldn't take up all the space and make it less ugly and you'd have a home for bees. Oh, uh, again, what can gardeners do? 30% of these native bees are tunnel nesters like that mason bee I mentioned. So I have uh, you can see I have piles of logs. Now that's just, that's not adequate. That's not good enough. I did not provide, uh, I didn't drill any holes into them, but I really don't have to. The bee will do that. But I had to provide a roof so that they're protected from rain. So that's a job I need to get done this summer. There's the iris, because that thick stem I've included. Uh, those of you who love iris and day lily. And I did learn one thing. Those are tough stems, and this is a little bee. So what you might do, I read some people say, maybe if you just bend, when the stem is through flowering, bend a stem, maybe 18 inches above the ground and bend it. And that will make a weakness in the side of the stem that our little tiny bee can get into to tunnel and make her nests. And here you've got a bumblebee, he could be something else, uh, on a uh, lamb's ear. A lot of people cut off the flowers of lamb's ear because they're straggly and ugly. But actually, they provide pollen, and they provide pollen early in the spring. And uh, okay, and then you can you drill holes. You keep a messy garden. Here, this is what I wanted to show you: the messy garden on the there. When the insects that are in your trees, when the caterpillars that are in the trees finally are big enough and they decide to pupate, they'll just uh, drop to the ground. Now the problem with dropping to the ground is that in lots of places, they drop to the ground in a concrete parking lot. They're not gonna make it, they die. Um, they drop to the ground, 
I don't know, into your mulch. Maybe we aren't going to make it there. This is my sister's garden. She just let it be wild. And her neighbors asked her about it. And she said, that is where all the animals that are in there have either rolled into a leaf or dug into the ground and are pupa and they are wintering. They are overwintering. And if they're not an animal like that, they're a little bitty mouse or vole looking for supper. And they're all, that's lots of those teeny tiny billion interactions that create nature. She's creating nature. Now over here, grandparent fixes that with their grandkids. You have all that stuff, straw, different. That's probably gonna house beetles too, things like that. But over here, I love this one. I got it online. See the wire? <laughs> because the woodpeckers will go find your cages like that, and they will just happily pick out all the larvae from those little sticks. So this person with this uh, screen has prevented woodpeckers. And there's another thing, I just love the bees. The female bee will lay her female eggs deep in the tunnel. And then she lays her male eggs at the entrance. The males have to be out first and ready to mate when the females do finally hatch. But also, the woodpecker gets the males, not the females. It's kind of a brutal truth. Um, now I've got a word here, I saw this, I can't remember who said it, but an, what I want you to think about is an ecocentric role for gardening instead of an egocentric role. Like instead of, oh, I have to have this because it's a beautiful plant and I want to do this, this beauty. So you instead think, okay, I want a beautiful plant, I want beautiful yellow plants. Is there a way I can get a beautiful yellow plant that will also help nature? Um, so that I'm growing insects and not just plants. I'm growing caterpillars and I'm growing pollinators. And I'm going to add native plants at every opportunity. And I'm going to find keystone plants where I can. And uh, there, are there are lists online of that. And oh, I was going to say, I made a handout for you. I really did. And on it, I listed the references so you could find pictures of larvae and pictures of insects. And also, um, the information about keystones and not those things. But in the heat of the moment, I left them at home, which is not a lot of use to you, but I will bring them next month in case you, in case you come back. And you'll have a plain little white handout, but it will have all the steps, the five guidelines, it'll have everything that you need to remember. Um, Aldo Leopold said we have to be stewards for our piece of the planet. And then everything that's alive up into the sky and everything that's alive, what, three feet down in the soil, in your yard, that's your piece of the biosphere. You own it, you're the steward of that living piece of the earth. And you can do things with that that help the other animals. Now, how do you design a garden? This is the five guidelines you really, um, I've tried to make it so that flowers aren't enough. You must structure the garden too. Um, I've talked about the flower structures I need you to look for, but there are some other things you can do to create habitat. First of all, I wanna show you this insect on that leaf. I believe it's a parasitoid. It's the first small wasp-like parasitoid I'd ever seen. And his behavior is what stopped me. That little guy was running all over the leaf, just not flying, running, running, running. And then he would hop to another leaf, run, 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 run. Maybe fly to the two leaves up, run, 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 run. And I thought, he's hunting. There's no question that insect was hunting. And he was tiny, so he was hunting for some bug to lay an egg on or to, to that, this one has an ovipositor. So probably to lay an egg inside. And then the ugly truth is, that egg laid inside an insect will hatch and the larvae will eat that little animal alive. And it, it's, they're like vampires and we don't like that, but they control insect populations and we have to have that. Okay, the five guidelines, I'm just gonna go quick. I have some more slides to talk to you about, but 
You must plant densely, more plants than you've ever planted of the same species. You must find diversity. You must have more different species than you've ever had. Uh, you must plant in vertical layers. Think of these understory tree, shrubs, uh, herbaceous plants, ground cover, vines. Think of them as layers of different leaves. Layers, layers, layers. Because insects live in a three-dimensional world. They hide in a three-dimensional world. Um, they hunt in a three-dimensional world. So that's what you want to do. And to do that, you plant these tree islands that I have everywhere. Um, I start with the tree, and then I start adding natives, some native shrubs, the native herbaceous plants, and I just keep finding things that work. What's happened to me is that if the tree develops and grows enough, I get too much shade, and I planted natives that need sun. You just never get it all right, no matter how hard you try, or I don't. Okay, density, plant more of everything. That is the largest cluster of single species flower I have ever had. And I worked intently on that. I said, no, you should have swaths of flowers. I picked the coneflower, it grows from seed. If they're sometimes very cheap at you know, box stores, you can get a lot of them. And that's a swath, and not even a dense swath, but it does cover all that ground. And so that's my swath of coneflowers. And if you look carefully, right behind them, there's a swath of Rebecca down there. Not as big, but a pretty respectable. I actually was proud of myself that spring. I said, you're getting there. Um, and the reason you want that many flowers is because uh, it's efficient for these small animals. The honeybee, for example, is going, going to the hive and saying, come with me, I have found flowers in their prime. All of them have the best nectar right now. They don't go to all the flowers. They go to the flower set in its prime. And so they might all only stick to the white flowers. And when all of that nectar is gone, they'll find the next batch. Maybe it's the pink batch of flowers that will have the nectar they'll go after. But the other thing is these native bees can only forage about, um, if you took, I don't even think it's 100 feet. 50, 80 feet circle around their nest, that's where they forage for food. So you want to make it easy for them. You want to have these four foot swaths of nectar because you don't want that, that little bee that's living 21 days and has to create her spe recreate her species and she's going to do it in 10, uh, 10 little nests, 10 little cells in one little tube. You have to help her and that's what we would be doing. And this is that New England aster, which is one of my favorites. This is that New England aster in the fall. And it is not at all unusual in the fall to see them covered with monarch butterflies. Remember, those babies are going south. They have to get to Mexico and they must be fat. So you want all of that nectar for the migrating butterfly. You want all of that nectar for the dying butterfly. I'm on my last legs, I've gotta get these last two cells done and I'm dead, but I will have fixed up my nest to overwinter. They're dying or they're going into diapause or they're migrating. In the, and this is a late fall flowering plant. Um, there are plants that go into September, but this dude, I have uh, middle of September, end of September, middle of October. If we don't have brutal frosts, and sometimes we can have a frost, it won't bother them. Uh, these things are still flowering with hundreds of flowers on them. That's why I like that New England aster. Okay, now the diversity thing. Many different species, and what I want you to think about is if you have lots of different species of plants, you have lots of different plant structures, different stems, different thicknesses of stems different leaf shapes, different everything. And that means you've created the complexity that will support many more diverse insects. Um, in this particular corner, of this is the south side of my house in dense, dense clay. And I've got an oak leaf hydrangea there that is not mature yet, but it's growing. And you can see it, it blooms in the spring. And then that is the um, penstemon, and it blooms in the spring. 
Now behind it, that tall set of leaves, that's a solidago, a native solidago that planted itself. And I think it's uh, canadens, solidago canadens, something like that. Now back on the elm tree, I don't think you can see it, it barely. I am growing Virginia creeper. People say, oh no, you don't want to do that. Virginia creeper does not girdle your trees, does not suck the life out of your trees like Euonymus does and the ivies do. It um, is a native plant, has gorgeous fall flowers, but other things. In the spring, we can't see it. I've never seen them. Teeny tiny flowers that little insects go find. And that's why I see little wrens. I'll see little wrens among those little leaves of that Virginia creeper. But more than that, in the last two years, I have found an insect that I've never seen before. This long caterpillar, I'm not kidding, I'm not exaggerating, a four inch long caterpillar, deep chocolate brown with white markings. It was actually exquisite. And that's a polyphemus moth larva. So I'm thinking to myself, Virginia creeper I've encouraged, and I finally got the animal that lives on Virginia creeper. I increased the biodiversity on my property by one caterpillar and by one plant. And that's what we're doing. One pairing at a time will, will incre uh, create habitat, a functioning ecosystem in our garden. Diversity is gonna produce the most important concept. I don't think I mentioned it yet, continuous bloom. You must have flowers in the spring. You must have flowers in the summer. You must have flowers in the fall and lots of them because that nectar is actually the food from all the adult insects. Now, if you plant it right, some of your plants will also produce seeds and berries that carry into the winter, which are gonna be, uh, your birds are gonna be grateful for that. And then you're gonna have continuous leaves uh, for the animals that eat leaves and continuous cover for the eggs and the larvae and the young of all these insects. And now I have two structures there. I'm not quite certain what good that yucca is, but I love the structure of the leaf. And next to that solidago, I don't get much pretty in my garden. I don't, I just don't. So when I see something like that, I say, hey, that's not bad. That's not bad, those two structures together. Of course, that entire yucca died this year. Now, diversity is another idea. Many homeowners will say, oh, I have a low area in my backyard and it's wet all the time. I've got to change my soil so I can grow more grass because, you know, grass is so valuable to wildlife. Instead, say, I have a low area, it holds water. What can I do with a place that is wet longer than other areas? Where you find a species that can tolerate wet feet. They can't be in a swamp, they can't be flooded, but they can tolerate that extra wet and look what you got. I'm not getting rid of that soil, I'm using that spot. That's not a problem for me anymore, it's a place to grow natives. And then down here is a hedge. We don't do hedges in our yards very often, so then instead, I, sometimes people have borders down beside their car, their driveways, things like that. That would be an opportunity to grow a variety of different kinds of plants. And that it's never gonna be disturbed, never gonna be mowed. Things can live in there and move around in there and bloom in there or whatever. And then that would give you a space that would normally, uh, I see sometimes in my neighborhood, people will just have that area covered with big pebbles. They've given up on it. And I'm not saying it'll be easy. That's a terrible place to have to grow if you're a plant. But it, it's probably possible. I'm absolutely positive that all of you have more skill in gardening than I do. I'm an experimentalist. I'll say, I've got these plants. I'm going to put them there and let's see what happens. That isn't the best way to grow for bees. So I'm trying to mend my ways. All right, you're gonna be planting in those vertical layers. This is, again, layers of leaves. I don't want, I want you to see layers of leaves. You'll need understory trees, shrubs, um, different branches, different stems, uh, different leaves, 
different kinds of structures and what you end up with as I like, here's my tree island, that's my cherry tree. It's a prunus. It's a, prunus leaves are a favorite of caterpillars and they support a lot of caterpillars. And it also produces uh, sour cherries. I've never ever gotten a cherry off of that tree. But that's not why I chose to grow it. I'd like to try a cherry pie sometime, but I grew it for those prunus leaves. And then here in the front is that aster that I'm growing for those flowers in the late fall. And here is that tiger eye sumac. And the sumac does support insect life some, but I mainly have to say, I grew that for the color. It's a beautiful. And then here it is mingling with that purple. Again, as if I had planned a piece of beauty. So when you're doing these vertical layers, think about in Kansas when you see uh, a low area in the Flint Hills, the trees and shrubs and things that can grow because there's more water there, or a, a riverbed or a streambed. So you'll have, you might be able to have a canopy tree and under that canopy tree, maybe multiple um, understory trees. Um, so that you create these layered things. And on that, I have a big cottonwood and I have that Virginia creeper climbing that cottonwood. I've never seen a polyphemus moth larvae there, always up by the house. And then underneath the house overhang as if it's protected maybe from uh, rain, maybe, maybe sun. Another uh, thing you'll be doing in your garden is creating edges. This is the uh, ecologists talk about, imagine seeing your yard from above. Imagine that it's a flat place, that, almost like a pie, that you could cut into pieces. And what they're saying is wherever you make one of these cuts, like maybe you have a flower border at the back edge of your yard, and that meets the lawn, right there on that horizontal view, you've got one habitat, the flowers, bumping into another, the lawn. The lawn is not a great habitat, but bumping in there. And what you've created is um, more opportunity for insects and animals to earn their living. And when I say earn their living, I mean either fight food or avoid becoming food. That's what they do. This is the best example, my friend's pond. The first thing she did was dig a hole. That altered her landscape. Then she took all that dirt and piled it up at one end. Now she's got a mound. Two alterations to that landscape. Then she piles it with, well, put water, you know, the way you have to do in a, a pond. Put water in the pond, a truly different alien habitat in that lawn. And then she stacks rocks, big rocks, everywhere are deep rocks. She's invited frogs and salamanders and toads, and of course beetles, the predatory beetles, the big black beetles, the big tiger beetles. She's invited all of those different animals, and they're all right there. So many places to hunt, so many places to hide. That's just uh, edges promote life and probably depth. I don't, I don't know how to say that. They promote the business of living. And finally, the last one of those things is that you have to give them water. They need water. Even right now, uh, this is an old bird bath. I kept it because it was my mom's and it was broken. And I'm kind of a hoarder. Anyway, and I finally went out and bought one of those things that keeps your water from freezing. And that first winter, I put that in there and I looked out one morning and I had a flock of North American bluebirds. And I will tell you on that morning, I had never seen a bluebird on my property, ever. That's bringing in life. That's bringing some additional complexity to my yarn. And there were also, of course, some robins. So now I try to have that ugly little piece of water uh, constantly available to the animals. And I have heard, and you guys might know better than me, that water is a, more important sometimes in the winter than seed or anything else. Now, one other thing you can do for the butterflies, well, for the bees too, is create a puddle. And that you've just a great big giant flat dish, you know, a pottery dish, gravel, maybe a flat rock, because butterflies like the sun in the summer. Find a space in the sun and keep that moist. 
I don't ever add food to it because I'm not, I don't want bacteria and I don't want to clean it all the time. But I uh, will salt it. They, uh, butterflies go in there with their feet, they taste the chemicals and that stuff and they pick it up and mo monarch butterfly males will make packets of those minerals and carry them to their females. And uh, that packet is considered kind of a bridal gift. And down in Mexico, when they first hatch in February, or maybe a little earlier than that, um, they're first hatching and they're coming out of that hatch, uh, awakening. They haven't been, they haven't bred, they haven't done anything, but they're now waking up and they're getting ready to go north. And what happens is there's a lot of mating going on. And I read that a lot of the males that are too small or too weak who will never make it north try really hard to mate there because that's going to be their only chance. And the females will allow themselves to be mated with multiple times because they haven't produced eggs yet. What they're doing is they're collecting these little packets of minerals because the research shows that if they have those packets of minerals, they have more eggs, healthier eggs, better eggs, better larva. So this female is doing that. Now it's dangerous to her if she mates too many times. And in fact, it's a rough mating. That male is not gentle with her. He's knocking her around, knocking her to the ground. And if they're real rough and she allows it to happen too many times, it will destroy uh, that part of her abdomen and she'll die. And so the, she's playing a game there. I want all these, I want all this healthy stuff, but I have to endure this other stuff. And she has to figure out how to do that, right? All right, now, this is my ending, sort of. If you follow simple guidelines, then your garden will not just be flowers. It will be much more. It will be a functioning ecosystem. You will have created complex habitat, homes for many insects. And what you've done is made possible many small interactions that were not there before. And those multiple interactions, that's nature. It's not the nature that was there before your house got built and put there. It's not, it's not the nature maybe that was there 100 years ago. It's the nature you are restoring into your yard. And it will be that nature, if we all do it, will be enough, according to my guru, Doug Tony, to save North American wildlife. You just have to go out and get all your neighbors to do this. And then you have to do, uh, some of you will have to talk to your homeowners associations because they're going to be shocked a little bit at what a butterfly garden can look like. I mean, it, it's, it's going to take a knowledgeable gardener ready to do battle. And you have to know what you're fighting for. Um, you're fighting for our wildlife. And that means through the use of insects. Now, who's going to come to your garden once you get it done? All insects, not just Specialist bees, not just butterflies laying their caterpillars, all of the insects, other animals, particularly birds. You know, there's some new research out now. They're, they've gone to areas where birds declined. And now these are not uh, scientific cause and effect, it's uh, correlation studies. And what they discovered in all of those areas where there these severe bird declines in the last 50 years, it was correlated with a severe decline in insects. And uh, that's what uh, they're beginning to think that maybe insect decline is having a huge impact. Um, one thing, I did not know this, one thing that made them particularly see that, that see here are all these birds that were, are in decline. And here's the insect decline. But look at this, doves haven't declined at all. Because you know, doves don't need um, see, uh, protein and fat for their babies. They produce that milk or something. And the doves show no evidence of decline in those places. Okay, the beneficials, I haven't talked about them all. The bees are pollinators, uh, flies are pollinators. Many insects are pollinators that are better than butterflies. Butterflies are not the best pollinators. Wasps, flies, bees, beetles are all good pollinators. Then the predators will come I have a whole speech where I show people the pictures of predators killing other insects. They become my favorite insect. They're stunning. Um, 
and then parasitoids, harder to find, harder to identify, and then decomposers. Uh, actually, E.O. Wilson, in his prediction about the sixth extinction, says, if the decomposers, if the insects disappear, he said, and the decomposers eventually disappear, which they would, he said, all we'll have left is fungus and bacteria. And E.O. Wilson says, I don't think humans can survive that. But of course, that's way down the road. And Ptolemy says, that's not going to happen because we're going to make gardens. And then there are neutrals. You lift that rock, and there's a salamander. You lift that rock, and there's that tiger beetle. They're neutrals. They don't want to see you. They don't know who you are. They don't care who you are. We don't want to see them. We are actually pretty shocked when we do, and we back out, which is what we should do. Um, and then the pests. And these entomologists study this a lot because it's a big deal. They have not found more than 2 to 5% of all insects are pests. And on this plant, on that sunflower, you can see over that leaf a spotted cucumber beetle. It's a pest. I don't even worry about it because that's the first spotted cucumber beetle I've ever seen just out. Here I am, a spotted cucumber beetle. I mostly see them in the jaws of wasps. I have multiple pictures of wasps killing that. I don't know if it's just stupid or slow or the wasp just love them. But that's what I, I don't see pests a lot. Okay, now this is kind of a review. I'm killing you with this. Um, you have to be a different kind of gardener. You have to be smarter than you've ever been. You have to do research. You have to really care about this. Uh, you have to learn about insects in your garden, even if you just do it after you see one. Run in the house and find out what it is. Uh, you have to be very knowledgeable about the right plants in the right place. I still plant natives in the shade because I want them there. They won't grow. The button bush will not grow. So I have one that's in partial shade. It's three times the size of the other two. So that's, I, I'm like a donkey. You have to hit me in the head with a two by four. But I finally thought, maybe you should move those other two shrubs. And I say, but it's not in the flower bed. So then I say, move the flower bed. Easy. But I had to be drug there. Uh, be more knowledgeable about the best plants. The best plants are always native plants. And then the, the best native plants, the keystone plants, are the best because you're focusing on the insects most likely to become extinct. Um, how do you design? You want to plant many, many flowers densely. You want to have many, many species all over the place, up, down, around, in swaths, however you can get them into your yard, and however big your garden is going to be, you'll decide how much. Uh, you're going to plant vertically, and you're going to plant with edge. Um, and then you, you've got to remember somehow to get water to them. Now, the insects don't much need it in the winter, but your other animals do. And then about, oh, and I only just slipped this in, about avoiding the use of pesticides. If you're going to grow insects, you cannot poison their habitat. It just can't be done. Now, this, these are, this is a true story. That is my butterfly garden. And it's some years after I started it. And it is really pathetic. And of course it isn't yet. It's early spring, so some, that's a solid doggo coming up there. And that's some yarrow coming up. And it's not that I don't have plants, but it's not very impressive. And that old battered piece of wood, that was a baby dresser I found in my barn. And I was worried about milkweeds spreading and taking over the world the way every gardener is afraid. And so I laid it on its back and I planted my milkweeds in there. And then I discovered the only milkweed uh, that is, I later brought in common milkweed, and that one you better be careful with. That one wants to grow, but it is gonna produce, when it's mature, a beauty unlike anything you've ever had in your garden. I had this spring, you know, we had that wonderful spring. I had common milkweed, five feet tall, covered with flowers, the air scented with that perfume, butterflies everywhere, uh, monarch butterflies everywhere, monarchs fighting over, monarchs mating in that area. I had more butterflies than I've ever seen, and it was that common milkweed that brought them in. Uh, it was just pretty, it was pretty wonderful. And then if you build it, this is that same flower garden. Now this is several years later, 
and you will see that I still am flawed, but I have tall plants, I have dense plants, I have different flowers, but I do not yet have enough numbers of each species. So I probably, that liantra is huge, and uh, I wouldn't need many of those, but maybe two more of those in there, and that's gonna make me have to give up something else. Kind of hard for me to do once I get a native going. The Tetonia grows from seed, that's the Mexican sunflower. And this one up here, this yellow sunflower, it's maybe something called lemony lace or little lemon. And sometimes if you want to be a citizen science, you're watching your garden, watching your flower, um, you'll get this notice or you'll read about, if you just get this packet of seeds and you plant this packet of seeds, and then what you'll do is, I don't know, we will say, please go count the insects on your lemon and sunflower. And you go out for that day and you count for 10 minutes and then you send them the data. All over the nation, gardeners are sending them data about what animals are on that sunflower. And, so, and that, they have all kinds of things like that. Okay, there we are. Any questions? <laughs> Probably not. You've been an outstanding audience. perfect soil this deep you know she does all that stuff but I do finally during the drought I watered one for you I had I had but I was trying to save my trees I, I had given up most of the perennials most of the herbaceous plants had already become dormant they were gone they said we're going to try to come back next year but my trees were still there and so I watered all my tree islands wherever I had trees or shrubs still alive and I used a lot of water and I'm in a rural water district too. But only for those terrible monsters. What do you do about rats? I've actually never seen a rat, but I have really? three cats. Um, I also have a, I have a lot of land, so the rats might be in my barn. <laughs> I don't go up there. And we have, um, I now have a dog, a puppy. He probably wouldn't catch a rat. No, I haven't had that. Although I will tell you, I did have a thyroid day today, and I read about that, and I have a lot of bird seed on the ground for my bird feeder. I said I might have to have a cleaner ground because that attracts the animals that are, might be attracting my thyroid. It also said I had to clean up my dog's poop better. <laughs> what else do I have to do in life? <laughs> yes. No, and I, I've been lucky a couple times at the end Today's. of the season, I'll look over and there's a whole bunch of echinacea. Yay! Mostly not. Dick Arboretum is in Tesla, Canada. And it's a volunteer organization and it's a it's a it's not a money making proposition because I can't talk about money making propositions. And I go they have a spring sale, usually in April. And they have a fall sale in September. And this is the first year I'm not on the boat. I just had a baby. Oh, Laura Candy. Mm -hmm. There's Laura Candy. Yes, yes. And you will, um, sometimes I, it, you have, they're selling you little baby seedlings. And that means you have to really take care of them. They're babies. So maybe, even if it's a native plant, it needs care. My concern was that a lot of people buy plants from the big box stores and think that they're nice native plants, but they have what's called neonicotinoids in them, and I'm sure you know this. Yeah. Now, I have not ever, the things I bought, but always at one store late in the fall, I, I look for that, and it has never said neonicotinoids. No, you have to ask them. That oh, okay. They don't have them in there. Yeah, and that's the danger that you don't know. 
Well, I do know that Dick is a source of good ones. And I do know there are some places on uh, like mail orders that will have, uh, for example, I mentioned the B lawn. Uh, there's a mail order magazine. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't think of that name. But Prairie Moon. Yes, Prairie Moon. And they have, um, they have all descriptions of all those kinds of lawn mixes that you could get if you were willing uh, to, and, and if your homeowners association won't kick you out of the neighborhood, uh, if you're willing to just add flowers to your lawn, because that would be helpful to the bees. Yeah. About a dozen years ago, I had to do carpentry on the top of the house, and I couldn't do my front yard after my front yard is in that same And for two hundred dollars, he designed the whole thing for me, and then I bought the plants, the baby plants. So, and it took about probably three or four years before it was starting to be like, well, it was it was beautiful immediately, but you know, it's twelve years later. It's work, so the, you're right, the new carpentry is a very good source. And they have uh, classes up there, so you could go and maybe plant classes, and they have blogs that they write, and they're, they're naturalists up there. And, um, I think uh, that's a neat idea. So you just paid him, and he came and designed you. And there was an article in the paper, and you know, and so I called him, and he came out, and he, I still have it to this day when I some of the things I didn't particularly like, and um, or I moved him around, he planted in rows, um, but um, he did a whole big parchment paper draw on the front yard and backyard, and everything that I should plant and what its name was and laid it out, then I did it. I planted it myself based on this plan. It was fun, and I'm, I'm enjoying and it. And you started the design. I never. First of all, when I started buying leaves, I just wanted to try them all. <laughs> so I would go to Dick Arboretum and, and I bought one of each name. And I spent a lot of money buying one of them. So my friend teased me. She said, so you plant in swaths of one. <laughs> <laughs> well, that wasn't too shaming. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now I'm, I did, when I went after lead plant, I told my sisters, I said, all right, you get six of that species you get six of that species, and I came home with 12 red plants. And then, even so, I still only have four now. But three are the same species. But I never, that's my problem. You saw many of those gardens, they almost look like cottage gardens. So I put the native there, and the native there, and the native there. Because I didn't know what would grow with a negligent gardener in, a, in kind of a no man's land. The reason I could water this here, Bob, is that I finally added um, not complex water systems, but those cords that leak. And then I could just take my garden hose to each tree I, and water there. And so the thing is, though, I had so many tree islands, another mistake, um, <laughs> it took me more than a week to go from tree island to tree island to tree island every day. But don't you think once you get some of those plants established, they just, they don't need water. They, they really don't. Mm -hmm. I, I don't feel like mowing the bloomer. I mean, that plant is, it blooms and blooms and blooms and I never water it. Yeah. I, I water mine, but it's more from the mushrooms that are yeah. out of the They all survive this yeah. drought, except for Coriopsis for some reason. And they're the most beautiful plants. You want something that that's an abundant plant and beautiful all summer long. You do have the deadhead. Yeah, the, I can't remember what kind of Coryopsis it was. Something Wolverine, I think. Wolverine or something green. Coryopsis. But so I'm that I'm going to be shopping for this spring to get one. I didn't mention this to you. Some of you may already plant native and you may know this, but it is literally true that when you plant that baby seedling. It will look like you're barely keeping it alive that first year. The second year, you'll think, did it die? Because it will take forever to come up. And when it does, it's still peeling. You say, what is this? But the fourth year, you think, well, there it is. They just grow, they're Kansas. They're not going to be fooled by anything. 
They say, the poor just gonna grow roots, and then when you see those pictures in magazines and books about the native plant roots, here you see the lawn's roots, the modern monoculture lawn. They're this long. And then the native grasses have roots of three feet deep, five feet deep, some of them 12 feet deep. That might be a shrub instead of a... No, it, no. It's, it's a grass. Not. And so these dudes, they give back to nature. That's what they do. Well, you're a builder of nature. You need them to help yourself build nature. And you might not see all the, all the benefits. You're not gonna see my oak trees have, uh, have acorns. I'll probably never see that. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for being really patient with your audience. Thank you. Oh my God.